And I'd like to introduce my co-author, Bruce Conklin, who's a doctor at UCSF in the Genome Medicine Division and a researcher at the Gladstone Institute. We're sharing one microphone, so we rationed it that I will give the talk and then he'll be available in the Q&A. What we mean by genome surgery is somatic editing, you know, not the embryo stuff, for a therapeutic purpose in vivo, where you're putting something into a person to edit their genome in their body. There's sort of an orthodoxy about this that originates with FDA, as I'll explain, but is much repeated, and that's that most of the products for this type of genome editing are going to be biologic drugs rather than devices. We have two things we want to talk about. One, we think this version is simplistic. It treats genome editing as a single unitary thing when it's actually incredibly diverse. And then there's a shaky statutory basis for that argument. Taking that first thing first, some of the types of human genome surgery, the first thing we're probably going to see applications of will be um, excision. Just if you have a deleterious <coughs> mutation that's producing a bad protein, you cut it out and remove it. Uh, that's fairly near on the horizon. A slightly more complicated version of that would be an excision in a regulatory region. Gene augmentation would get at other things, such as a loss of function gene variant. You would put in a little gene construct to perform that lost function. And that one is, um, I was surprised to learn you don't do that at the exact site where the, the defective gene is. You can just put it in elsewhere and it commences to make the protein that's needed. And then gene reconstruction is probably farthest down the line because it's difficult. It's actually editing nucleotide by nucleotide a defective gene in place. Now, some of these are appropriately characterized perhaps as devices. The little scissors you're using to do an excision look a lot like a very small medical device. But when you're putting a construct in, that starts to look like a drug. So the question arises whether one size fits all for regulating these very complex surgeries. The distinction matters for a lot of reasons. The drug and device frameworks have different features, which may be, you know, allow better oversight. The device regulations are more risk stratified, more flexibility on what types of pre-market evidence are acceptable. Uh, could affect the timeliness and cost of innovations, and that could really make a difference of who will have access to these treatments and who won't. And then there's a question of deference to medical practice regulators. Sometimes you're making individual patient-specific risk-benefit decisions, and that may be something where FDA would regulate the tool, but medical practice regulators need to oversee what's effective for a particular patient. This is just an elaboration of that. For devices, we have custom devices such as the orthodontic appliance where FDA does not oversee effectiveness. Instead, the physician who prescribes the custom device makes the decision whether it will be effective. The sort of counterpart on the drug side would be a compounding pharmacy, but as we know, FDA is very leery of allowing compounding of biologics because they're complex, big molecules, and if you let a compounder mess with them, you may very well ruin it. So um, we don't really have that customization capacity for biologics that we have for devices. An important point is you can restrict a device, and by this, perhaps control off-label uses of it, that's actually available for all risk classifications of devices. For a class one low risk device, you can do it with a rulemaking. For a class two, you can do it as part of a performance standard. And then for a PMA or high risk device, you can make it a condition of the approval. The RIMS, which is the counterpart thing that you can put use restrictions on a drug, only comes in when there's some evidence of a very serious risk. So you can't get at control of the uses of the the low-risk gene editing tools if they're drugs. Also very important, this product versus practice regulatory 
distinction, and it's really well portrayed in appendectomies. FDA regulates the scalpel to make sure it's safe and effective for cutting out your appendix. FDA cannot say that it's safe and effective for a particular individual to go through life without an appendix. That's a medical judgment that needs to be made by a physician. Now, as to my second point, the orthodox view that everything is a biologic drug, we're trying to trace it back. We're well into our research and hope to have a paper out very shortly. But here's what we're coming up with. Where did that orthodoxy come from? There was a 1993 policy statement by FDA in which FDA defined something called a gene therapy product and then opined that if a gene therapy product used a viral vector, then of course it was a biologic and also a drug. If it didn't use a viral vector they, and was, say, a synthesized gene construct, it would be a drug. So this is a point where FDA said these are all drugs. Now that statement was made with no prior notice and comment. It was just a policy statement. It has, it's not entitled to any Chevron deference. And worse yet, by defining this thing in a policy statement and putting people who make that thing under FDA's drug process, FDA was creating substantive rights and duties. This is not an interpretive statement. It violated the APA and FDA's own procedure not to have notice and comment for that. So this statement, I think, is entitled it's to skid more deference, which is it's entitled to deference in accordance with how persuasive it is. That's not very persuasive to say it's a drug without any further explanation. This is the closest we have to a statutory definition of a biological product. It's in the Public Health Service Act. It's a virus, you can read it yourself, or analogous product. That's an Oxford comma, so presumably if it's <laughs> analogous to any of those things, it could be a biologic. CRISPR-Cas9, which of these things is it analogous to? You could say maybe it's a permissible interpretation to say that CRISPR-Cas9 is analogous to a virus. That might be a permissible interpretation if you're getting Chevron deference, but this thing is entitled to skid more deference, and it's unpersuasive. Now, when did FDA last make a proper Chevron eligible statement using notice and comment rulemaking? I'm still looking for it. <laughs> but the most recent one I've found in this space was in 1986. And it said there aren't any statutory provisions for biotech. And we're just going to slot them into the proper definition, whether it's a biologic, a drug, or a device. And FDA said some of these things are going to be drugs and or biologics, and some will be devices. And we're just going to go the definition product by product and make that decision. That's entitled to deference. So we come down to what's the definition of a drug or a device. They have in common this notion that both are intended for use in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, or treatment of disease, and both are intended to affect the structure or function of the body. Clearly, human genome surgery meets that definition. It comes down to is it a drug or a device, and the statutory definition says a device does not achieve its primary intended purposes through chemical action. I think this tendency to say that all these products or drugs comes from the fact that we know these are molecules and they react with the genome chemically, but there's a guidance for that. FDA has been very clear that the mere fact that something exhibits chemical action does not make it a drug as long as it isn't achieving its primary intended purpose through that chemical action. And there are lots of products that react chemically with the body but are regulated as a device. The, the lasers used in eye surgery are good examples. That cut with the laser is a chemical reaction, but it's still a device. We're specifically focusing on that first 
realm of surgery involving excision and without prejudicing whether the other types of surgery would be drugs or not, we think there's a very strong case that excising a deleterious gene variant, the CRISPR-Cas9 or other gene editing tool is a device. It's cutting. The health benefits do not come from an ongoing chemical action by the cutting tool. They come because the bad gene is thereafter gone. Last slide, FDA has another guidance that says, if a product could conceivably meet both the drug and the device definition, we're going to classify it as a device as our first preference. So what we're saying is FDA needs to follow its own guidance here, regulate excision tools as devices, and that in no way prejudices the ability of other manufacturers to ask FDA to regulate their gene editing tool as a drug if they want to, and it in no way ties the agency's hand when it sees something that really is a drug to treat it as a drug. Thank you. I knew. <laughs> everything in the regulatory section of the report was vetted by the general counsel's mm -hmm. office, I feel no personal investment in it being mm -hmm. accurate in the, in the NAS report, right? So if they got it wrong, therefore we got it wrong, that's fine because it's their problem, not mine. That said, <laughs> that said, um, I'm puzzled by a couple of things here. Um, the first is uh, this notion that it's not a not chemical action when the point of the deletion, because we're talking only about deletions here, is in fact to change how the remaining material functions. So yes. it is about a chemical or metabolic, uh, metabolic function because of the excision. So that's the first. <coughs> the second was I couldn't make, I really didn't understand where you said that the oversight is better for devices. For s some is, applications. Uh, um, um, for the custom device. Um, well, we need, probably need to talk Cedar is laughing now. I, I, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, no question about that. The third is actually one that's more about administrative procedure, and I'm not as much of an expert as some of the people here, I'm sure, and that is a lot of what you're talking about are guidances that were put out, and I don't know exactly what the history was at FDA when guidances began to supplant rules. I mean, realistically, nobody wants to use a rule anymore. It'll mm -hmm. never get through OMB. Right. And so you do everything by guidance, which right. theoretically is not legally binding, but everybody knows in mm -hmm. practice it's incredibly important. And those are subject to a certain amount of notice and comment. It's just right. not as formal as the notice and comment for rulemaking. So it might be important to know kind of the, the parallel sequence of well. events in the administrative procedure along with the statements. Um, because that seems to be crucial to your argument about Chevron deference, which regardless may be going away well, these days anyway. Right? Exactly. Well, first of all, uh, in regard to quoting the NASIM report, we in no way intend to criticize that. We understand that report was taking a 30,000-foot view not only of U.S. law, but the law of other like jurisdictions. Said, I'm, not, I'm truly not defensive about it, because right. it's, it's wrong, it's their problem. Yeah, but I was just quoting that as the fact that this orthodoxy is very respected and receiving it. Um, the 1993 guidances FDA issued on various aspects of, of gene editing have been enormously influential and are still followed, the one on, on genetically modified food being an example. Mm -hmm. It was upheld and given Chevron deference a month before Mead, the decision that clarified what is entitled to Chevron deference. Had it come along a month later, I think the outcome would have been different. But um, FDA does use a lot of guidances. They are, nowadays it has the level one, level two guidances, and, and the ones that are creating substantive duties would be more expected to have notice and comment. But um, this, is just saying this traces back as far as we can tell to a guidance that doesn't have any particular status and doesn't seem to be a um, interpretation of the statute that, that makes a lot of sense. So we think there's room to debate. FDA regulates things product by product. I think this notion that there's a sweeping statement we can make about all gene editing is just counter to um, FDA's way of doing things. Different gene editing products, some may be devices, some may be drugs, and that's a decision that will be made each time someone puts one forward. We think sometimes the drug regulatory pathway will be superior 
for example, if it's something for a hemoglobinopathy that a lot of people have where you have a large enough sample you could run a clinical trial, that's great. But some of these things are going to be customized tools. And I'm going to hand my microphone over to my much smarter co-author <laughs> to talk about, about this. <laughs> Uh, not smarter, but uh, just one, a couple of things. The other types of the, the tools that we're going to be using for the excision are also pro, uh, protein RNA complexes. So we're not talking about introducing a DNA, uh, which in, in th is so in a, you're, you're editing, but you're, uh, all it is is an RNA protein complex, uh, which, is, which is in transiently performs the excision and then, um, and then uh, results in the loss of function of the, of the disease gene. And of course, the, the normal gene does continue functioning just like your normal intestine continues functioning uh, after an appendectomy, but it allows it now to, to function in a, in a normal way. But it's not interfering with the natural function of that normal gene. Um, the other thing that uh, is important to note is, I think, because of the, uh, this is a terrific collaboration because actually we are, because of the work uh, and the, the collaboration, we're actually defining clinical trials in such a way that we can, and, and studies in such a way that we can actually, uh, you know, provide the proof, essentially, or the, the evidence uh, either for or against uh, our hypothesis that, in, in fact, a series of scalpels, for instance, uh, could be used. And what we see is a patient comes in, they are, are, are sequenced. Uh, we, we know uh, for many of these genes, there's hundreds of mutations that cause the negative uh, result. And so it's impossible to make a scalpel for each, but we have a series of scalpels that say, for instance, are, are, uh, take advantage of ancestral uh, SNPs uh, so that maybe 10 or 20 scalpels, essentially you choose two for, the, for Alta would get uh, one set and, and uh, Barbara would get a different one uh, because you have different ancestors and then you'd use those to, to take them out. But the individual combination would be, had to be individualized for every patient and it would be Im almost impossible actually to get this through the drug regulatory pathway because it's customized per patient. The numbers of patients that we're talking about are, are, are small for each pair of guides uh, that are, are scalpels, but in some we're talking about tens of thousands of people who have a genetic disease. We have, re have to realize that of the genetic diseases that are really available for uh, that, that could be uh, treated with a drug type, type treatment, uh, it's only probably five, less than 5% of all genetic diseases. 95% of genetic diseases are, 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 are completely inaccessible via the drug pathway because it's just too expensive. And uh, this is what we're proposing is, is safe and would open the door for a larger group of people. Have we cracked yet? Are we out of time? One and a half minutes. A quick question or a quick answer. Okay. Why think that it has to be drugs or devices rather than something entirely new? Well, that's a good question. And the question from Glenn Cohen of Harvard is uh, why do we think it has to fit into one of the existing slots on which FDA has jurisdiction? Uh, Congress could define something new. They have continuously not done that since the <laughs> 1980s, but That's right. now that they're working at prime effectiveness, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And my Greenwall project has been looking at the various ownership rights that people have in their, specifically in their genetic data, but that also bleeds into biospecimens as well. So I've been thinking a lot about the possible entitlements we might have related to our bodies. And in so doing, I really want to answer the question, so what are the rights we have in our bodies? What are the rights we want to have in our bodies? And then what can the law do to facilitate that? And really, you know, 30 years ago, at the beginning of the genetic revolution, we were debating whether or not people should have some kind of rights in their bodies. And at this point, here we are, three decades later, and it's pretty clear that we, in fact, do have some rights in our bodies, right? But those rights are pretty scattershot. They're spread across a variety of doctrines and different sources of law, right? So this question about what are the rights we have in our bodies 
And what are the rights we don't have in our bodies, which is also an important question, is something that I think is just going to continue to grow in importance as we see biomedical science advance. So we know we have the push for more access to genetic and other kinds of health-related data in terms of the Precision Medicine Initiative. Uh, we also have the recent FDA approval of the direct-to-consumer genetic testing for medical conditions. Right? So that's a whole other source of data that is going to be out there with people getting access to it and being stored in databases and all of that. Right? And then we also have this rise of you know, implantable devices and wearable devices. So we have more data related to ourselves and our bodies and our health than we ever did. And so it raises these questions, okay, so, so what do we own? What can we control? And you know, what rights are we potentially giving up or we don't have in the first place? So really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to track the legal rights that we might have related to both our tissue, our biospecimens, as well as related to the data that comes from those biospecimens. Uh, and this is a very, very preliminary stage project. I've called it BioRights, because that is something that I think I found in a, a Washington Post article or something that said, more patients are asserting BioRights. And I was like, that's a good law review title, right? So what are BioRights, right? So what does this mean, right? And, and I think that it's, it's my hope that if I can manage to catalog what our bio rights are and what they aren't, we can think then more deeply about the rights that people enjoy and then the rights that people want that they might not currently have. So this is at the very beginning stages, and I really only have one slide, right, which is I, I've taken a preliminary stab at thinking about the different rights that we might have in our bodies and the different places within law where we might find those rights. And I'm sure that this is a, this is a preliminary list, so I'm sure that it's incomplete. So I'm very excited to have the opportunity to present to you all today so that I can supplement it and add nuance. Uh, but so this is just a very rough outline. So you know, first of all, of course, we have some constitutional bio rights. Right? And this is predominantly resides in the right to privacy. Uh, and these other rights that I'll mention are arguably subsidiary, right, to the right to privacy. But, you know, we have a right to bodily integrity. We have a right to, to freedom from restraint. Of course, we have reproductive rights and other rights related to medical decision making. So, you know, we also have the right to dictate, you know, what medical treatment we want, the right to refuse even life-saving treatments, right? And then at least one court has held that a, a person should not be compelled to donate tissue even if it's medically necessary. Right, so there was someone in Pennsylvania, and I think he had a cousin who was in need of bone marrow, and the cousin that had could have been the potential donor just didn't want to donate. And the courts got involved, and the court said, you know what, this would infringe on, on your constitutional rights to compel someone to give tissue even if it's medically necessary. Right, so we do have some constitutional protections that apply in this sphere, but of course we all know, right, that the constitutional rights here are limited in some respects, right? We're all familiar with Jacobson v. Massachusetts, right? We're all familiar with Buck v. Bell. And these right. cases, I know, right? And these cases, right, they predate the substantive due process revolution, but they're still out there and they do still inform the kinds of rights that we might have related to our bodies, right? So we have these constitutional rights. Uh, we also have some federal statutes that give us rights related to the body. I've written a lot about the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And this particular statute, it protects against discrimination on the basis of genetic information in both health insurance and in employment. Um, and it also confers a what I call a privacy right, because the law actually prohibits both health insurers and employers not only from using genetic information from dis for discriminating, but health insurers and employers cannot even ask for genetic information, right? So it's a really interesting question. So if your employer even asks you to give over, you know, to take genetic tests, then that would theoretically violate the statute, and you could get some damages for it. Uh, so those are some statutory bio rights, at least at the federal level. Uh, also, too, there are some state statutes that confer rights related to the body. I mentioned I've been thinking about ownership interests in genetic data and specimens. And I actually had two fantastic undergraduate students do a 50-state review of statutes looking for property rights. Because uh, I had heard you know, piecemeal things. Every so often, actually, in Texas, our ledge meets every other year, every so often this bill gets introduced that says 
that the legislature is going to grant Texans rights in our property. And in fact, you know, Governor Abbott, this was part of his campaign platform, is like, like your DNA is yours and you deserve to own it, so we're going to make your DNA your property, right? And to us, that sounds extremely confusing, right? I think it's very, it sounds good to constituents, and obviously, it doesn't ever, it doesn't actually ever make it through. But these notions of genetic, genetic property laws, it's like, well, I want to see how many are actually out there. Uh, and these very diligent students, they found five states that have actually created some sort of statute. And those states are Alaska, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, and Louisiana. And these states actually say, you know, a individual is either your tissue or your data is your property, um, which, is, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and I'm, I want to take a closer look at those. Um, of course, also, some states have informed consent statutes. We're all pretty familiar with those. Um, also, too, and this is a place where I think I get, get help from folks here, I don't know a ton about the, uh, the right to donate organs and tissues. Uh, I do know right, that the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act says that you can designate tissue and organs. And I did find at least one case where the designated recipient who didn't get the organ tried to sue and was, was found to not have a cause of action. But I'm actually, I'd love to know if there's any remedies for the donor. So if I say I want to give you my kidney and it goes to someone else, do I have a cause of action? And I actually have had trouble finding the answer to that. So hopefully you all can enlighten me at some point today, right? Uh, so those are some of the state rights. And uh, of course, we also have regulatory bio rights. So again, the common rule, right? So this is informed consent related to research. Of course, there's HIPAA. And HIPAA also gives us some privacy protections, right? There's the privacy rule. There's also some HIPAA non-discrimination provisions. And these are, are more played out, right, in the, the regulations and the actual statutes. And then, of course, there are the HIPAA CLIA regs that give an affirmative right to access some kind, to access laboratory results. All right, so those are my statutory uh, and regulatory bio rights. And then we have some just plain old common law bio rights. And so tort law. So I would propose to you all that tort law gives us some rights in our body insofar as you know, battery is a tort. If you don't get informed consent, that's a tort. Invasions of privacy, breaches of confidentiality, these are all things where someone could theoretically sue. Right? So those are rights that relate to our bodies. Also, too, we can find bio rights in contract law. And I actually teach contracts. So this is one of the areas where I'm most interested. Because what's happening is folks are actually now interested in contracting around rights to their bodies. Right, and so I think many of us are familiar with the example of uh, PXE International, right, which they formed a collective, and then you know to, to then give access to their tissue bank, they you know required continuing interests and rights related to the, the research that came out of it, right, and so it is possible to contract for this these things I call bio rights, um, and then also too this might be the best venue for us to get continued rights to control or to collectivize, all right? So we're thinking, you know, in terms of if we want to create some kind of commons and collectivize, that would probably, the legal tool we would use for that would probably be something that would be contract law. Um, so some preliminary observations from this chart that I've put together for you guys today. Um, I think for the most part, from what I can see, and I would love pushback or, again, nuance here, most of our bio rights seem to be negative, right? That is, their freedoms from instead of rights to things, right? So that's one thing. So freedom from bodily restraint, privacy is really freedom from invasion, freedom from discrimination or these non-discrimination provisions, freedom from unwanted touching and medical procedures. But insofar as we're, gr we're granting positive rights, see, at least at the regulatory level, right, when we're thinking about the access to lab results, you don't have a private right of action, and you don't under the common rule, right? And so you, you know, have to go through an agency, right? And the major exceptions to this is we do see some positive rights in these state property laws, and then these contractual rights that are negotiated ex ante. So the thing is, people seem to quite clearly want more positive rights in their bodies, and they want to be able to enforce those rights directly and not depend on agencies. And so case in point, Henrietta Lacks' family was recently in the news again 
threatening to sue a lawsuit. And they found a lawyer who said that they had this theory of continuing tort, that her family had continued to experience these legal harms from Hopkins and they were going to recover, right? So nothing's been filed to date, I've been waiting. Um, but I'm really curious what this lawsuit looks like because to me, I feel like calling this a continuing tort is really trying to fit a square peg into a round hole because they don't really want a freedom from, right? They don't really want freedom from invasion. They really want a right to. The thing they want is they want to be compensated, right? So they're trying to take, some, take a negative legal right that they have and construct it into some kind of positive right. Um, so my thoughts here are that I don't think these genetic property statutes are going to gain popularity anytime soon, right? So that's likely not going to be our vehicle. So what can we do to give folks some kind of a right of action related to their bodies that they can enforce directly? And I think the best bet is you want to contract for those kinds of rights ex ante. People should negotiate before they give their tissue, before they go in, in the data bank, right? However, I think that there are, of course, some issues with contract law as a primary tool for bio rights. Uh, first of all, that's a piecemeal ad hoc kind of a solution, right? So we're just doing it on a one-on-one -on -one kind of a basis. It doesn't really help us as a group know the kinds of rights that we have in our bodies. Also, too, it could slow research while people dicker over terms, right? You want more of an interest. You want you know, a particular percentage of something. So it's possible this could have a not great effect on research. Also, too, right, the contractual rights would depend on the relative sophistication of the parties. So people who don't know to negotiate won't. People that do know to negotiate will. And again, this is something that could lead to disparities, right, related to how sophisticated an individual is. Um, so I have a minute left, but I will go ahead and uh, end and there. But I would say my question's for you all, right? Uh, what rights am I missing, <laughs> right? What am I missing? What can I add? Uh, and should I be thinking about this differently in this project to sort of think about, first of all, what are the rights we have? And then, you know, if we want to create rights that people can exercise directly, what's the best vehicle for doing so? so thank you. Oh, wow. Hi, guys. <laughs> A lot of people. Yeah, yeah Sonia and then John. Yeah. How do you sort of figure that with it's named under the DNA, but that sort of thing? Because that's a much more common thing than the property right oh, yeah. um, in those five states. The other thing to think about is how are, are the rights limited to a particular context? Because those property rights are really in the context of insurance, and I don't think they're understood more broadly. I think only one state looks at it as tissue samples. And then, yeah. of course, you have the flip side of the common law declaring that there is not a property interest. So you've got those tensions right. at work there. But on the contract route, you might want to think about some of the comparisons with contracting around disposition of embryos. Yeah. Right? Because that's, that's right. a particular kind of tissue, it's a particular context, but at least we see a lot of strength of that approach, a lot of jurisdictions engaging in that direction. And so that would bolster your idea of the contract approach. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. So, that, so I should definitely, you're absolutely right, I should definitely add all the, I mean, I'm so Gina focused, I should definitely add all those early state, yeah. you know, those, you know, 46 or 48 state laws in. That's, that's fantastic. Cool. Yeah, that's great. And then, John, yeah. Uh, yeah, when you mentioned property rights, you know, I think of genetics. I just uh, two few quest questions. Would it matter if, or does it matter that uh, Moore versus Board of Regents said there's not a property right, but a, a right to informed consent? Explain, explain how, how that matters. And, and the second point is, if one uh, discards uh, something that has one's DNA, Right. Abandonment and the plea for unequal access. Or does their right of access include a right to do <coughs> genomic testing to identify all that information aside from just confirming identity? So the first question, I think this is a, such an interesting issue. So this has been so. I think that the so you can't contract for something you don't own, right? So I couldn't sell Sonia John's car. Right, because it's not mine to sell. So if Moore says, if the common law says you don't have an interest in your biospecimen or in your material, can then you make, can you contract around it? Uh, and you know, I think you can in part just because people 
are, and, the, and this is something, this is a different question, the enforceability of these contracts are really interesting to me because one of the things I've been doing is looking in the terms and conditions of the direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies, and they say some really interesting stuff. Like, I'm sure you all remember everyone was upset when 23andMe sold access to their database, and that was because people agreed to donate, and they actually signed, in, in, in the fine print, they signed over any rights they had in the data, right? And then um, I think Ancestry, in their terms, they say you maintain rights in your genetic information. However, you know, they have this license to do whatever they want with it, right, in terms of selling it or studying it or all those things. And so I'm actually working uh, with one of the VPs at Ancestry because we're, we're interested in figuring out, you know, do all of those terms and conditions mean anything? Can I grant a license in something that I don't own? I don't think you can, right? So there are, there is something that's running in tension to more there that I think is really interesting and that we haven't completely unpacked because people are signing contracts and negotiating around this stuff. And so if there's no underlying legal entitlement, I'm not sure what that means. Are we just creating legal entitlements out of thin air? So that's something that I definitely I have on my mind that I've been thinking about. And then in terms of discard, I'm so we ask your discarding the data question again. I've yeah. <laughs> Right, so, so this is, yeah, this is, well, so that, so it's an, yeah, it's an interesting question, and there's something uh, that Mark Rossian has referred to as genetic stalking, which is, you know, you take the, you know, you, I come around, I collect all the cups, and then I, you know, test, and I learn all kinds of things about you guys that you didn't want me to know, right? And that has been, I think Elizabeth Joe has written about it being, crim that's criminalized in some states, I think, and in the UK, yeah. Um, so you're not, and so I think that's an unauthorized use. So having possession of the specimen is not necessarily as having permission to test the specimen. And I think that is true, I, I would imagine it's true in the criminal spheres too. You're testing for identification and you're not supposed to be figuring out, you know, ancestry or heritage or something like that. One minute left. Oh, okay. yes. Oh, well, shoot. I'm sorry. Okay. That's, yeah. well, okay. I'll be fast. Um, the distinction between positive and negative, I think you can put some pressure on that when you start looking at Mm -hmm. Actually, I know someone who was, they're pushing back on a facility that has, keeps requesting payment for storage of hundreds of embryos, and they're trying to see how far they can get that facility. Yeah. Are they going to start making collections? Are they going to destroy the embryo? <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So I think that that's, and I will say very quickly that I think that that when we, anytime we talk about property interests, right, we all know it's a bundle of, of rights, and unbundling the bundle can be very confusing sometimes. And so that's one of the things that I've talked about related to genetic data. We might not have a property interest because of more, but we do have a right to exclude via informed consent. We do have a right to access via the HIPAA CLIA regs, right? Uh, and we do have these these new contractual rights to commercialize. So it's it's interesting to think about, right, even when it's not exactly called property, it still feels like something like ownership, and I think I'm probably out of time. So Great. thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I feel like I should apologize because I am now the first person up here who doesn't have any slides. Yay! Sorry. Or you're welcome. Um, so let me uh, start out by regaling you with some stories, because I really like storytelling. I think it's a good way to uh, expose um, novel legal problems. So in May 2015, John Wakefield was sentenced to life imprisonment for the strangulation murder of Brett Wentworth. 
The primary evidence in the case was DNA on Wentworth's arm and shirt collar and on the murder weapon, which was an amplifier core. In order to link Wakefield to the crime scene DNA, investigators relied on True Allele, which was a privately developed and privately owned software program for analyzing DNA mixtures that DNA, the typical DNA analysis can't resolve. And yet, when Wakefield's lawyer sought to examine True Allele's source code, he was rebuffed. True Allele's source code, its creator, Mark Perlin, steadfastly maintained and has continued to maintain, is a trade secret. None of the investigators, prosecutors, prosecutors, defense attorneys, or even the judge in Wakefield's case were permitted to access the source code of this crucial software. Indeed, to date, no one outside of Perlin's company has seen or examined that source code. Still, the judge admitted the DNA analysis that True Allele generated, and Wakefield was convicted. Wakefield's case, however, is not the only recent example of the criminal justice system relying on tools developed in private hands and shielded by assertions of trade secret protection. In March 2016, the Maryland Court of Special Appeals became the first court to hold that the police cannot, without a warrant, make use of a Stingray device, which basically turns a cell phone into a real-time tracking device of startling precision. Baltimore police had used a Stingray device called a Hailstorm to track Karen Andrews to a particular residence where they arrested him on charges of attempted murder. In order to acquire the Hailstorm device, the Baltimore Police Department had had to enter into a non-disclosure agreement with the FBI, agreeing, among other things, uh, not to disclose its use of the Hailstorm device, even to a court, and even if that meant dropping charges altogether, which has happened in other similar instances. In holding that the warrantless use of the Hailstorm device was unconstitutional, the court in this case, admonished the police department for intentionally concealing its use of the device from a judge when seeking a court order to track Andrews. Harris Corporation, the private company that manufactures and sells the bulk of Stingray devices, including the Hailstorm device, initially secured the cooperation of the federal government in preventing disclosure of these devices based in part on their, quote, valuable proprietary information. Their value is a trade secret. One more story. In July 2016, the Wisconsin Supreme Court affirmed Eric Loomis's six-year sentence of imprisonment despite the fact that his sentence was based in part on a recidivism score generated by software whose source code was, <laughs> you guessed it, not disclosed on trade secret grounds. Loomis had pled guilty to fleeing the, the police and driving a stolen car. The trial court's pre-sentence report included a recidivism risk score developed or generated by a program called Compass and Loomis was deemed at high risk of committing another crime. Compass, like True Allele and the Hailstorm device, is privately developed software that its creator, North Point, claims is proprietary and a trade secret. Compass generates recidivism scores based on information in a defendant's criminal file and an interview with a defendant. Although Compass was originally designed to aid the Department of Corrections in making placement decisions, managing offenders, and planning treatment, in Loomis's case, and as Loomis's case illustrates, judges have now begun basing sentences of imprisonment or the length of such sentences on the scores the Compass generates. This is so despite the fact that, once again, defendants, defense counsel, departments of corrections, and the courts who make use of Compass scores don't know how the scores are generated. And this is so despite emerging evidence that the software is racially biased, generating higher recidivism scores for blacks than for similarly situated whites. The Wisconsin, support, the Wisconsin Supreme Court nonetheless okayed the use of compass scores in sentencing so long as they're not the only factor that a judge identifies in sentencing, which of course will rarely be the case, that they will only uh, rely on a compass score. The US Supreme Court, meanwhile, has um, recently called for the views of the Solicitor General in response to Loomis's cert petition. So, let me bring all these together. In each of these cases, defendants, their attorneys, sometimes even the judges who's in whose courtrooms innocent guilt or imprisonment is, deter is determined, are operating at an informational disadvantage due to the exercise of private law tools. Right? The technologies at, in use in each of these cases pit private law tools for secrecy against criminal justice due process norms. In particular, assertions of proprietary information and trade secrets now permeate the criminal justice process. So the paper that I'm working on 
tries to tra tackle this growing field of cases with a particular focus on the interplay of trade secret law and criminal justice due process norms. I'm trying to thread cases together from investigation to trial to sentencing to show that the role of private law mechanisms in shielding criminal justice activities is growing and that these mechanisms degrade our traditional due process protections. And my hope is that this paper can help me do three things, right? So first, I want to shed new light on how these pri private secrecy tools um, and trade secret assertions, foremost among them, are increasingly affecting American criminal justice. These are technologies designed by private firms, subject to assertions of private law protection, and they're now embedded at multiple stages in the criminal justice process. Um, courts, prosecutors, police, et cetera, are already making use of this growing cohort, cohort of technologies. And uh, while most of these technologies have been identified and discussed separately in the scholarship, most folks treat these technologies as if they're operating in separate silos. So I'm trying to broaden our perspective by bringing all of these together um, and show a continuity of uh, the, a similar problem where we have this recurrent tension between trade secret assertion and private uh, and, and due process norms in criminal justice. My second goal uh, is to construct an argument that the use of these private law tools um, puts new pressure on traditional due process principles. So private law protection surrounding the inner workings or even the existence of these new technologies threatens to undermine the abilities of judges and of defense counsel to ensure that criminal justice respects constitutionally significant privacy interests, condemns only the guilty, punishes the guilty fairly. Right? Now, different constitutional criminal defense protections apply at different stages of the criminal justice process, the Fourth Amendment for investigation, the Confrontation Clause at trial. But the Due Process Clause is kind of a bedrock principle throughout. And so my hope is to kind of focus on that background principle, that bedrock principle, um, to, again, thread a, common, uh, or thread a common needle. No, put a thread through the needle through this whole system. Right, OK. Now. Stop that metaphor, right? Yeah, that was a terrible <laughs> yeah. metaphor. I'm sorry. Um, now, there, there, there's a, a body of literature that argues that, a, that access to source code for these kinds of technologies um, isn't always necessary in order to hold an algorithm accountable, right? Rather, that algorithms can be designed to be testable and accountable in other ways. But in this field with these kinds of technologies, and, and particularly where private companies are acting vigorously to shield how their products work, even from law enforcement and from courts, um, and where they don't permit vigorous outside testing, I am skeptical that there is adequate consideration given to accountability in design. All right, third, I'd like now having identified a problem and argued that it is a problem, I'd like to try to answer the problem um, to sketch out a way forward turning again to private law mechanisms to mitigate this public-private tension. So at a minimum, I think there's clearly a need for active judicial oversight in order to safeguard public justice. So judges retain sufficient uh, supervisory authority to compel production of the underlying technology while nonetheless protecting that technology from broad dispersal. In indeed, judges have routinely employed just these kinds of mechanisms, including uh, ex parte and camera review and sealing court documents or proceedings outside of the criminal context in adjudicating trade secret and other intellectual property disputes. So we can perhaps find a solution for this trade secret problem by looking at cases involving trade secrets. So the former tool, the first one, in ex parte in camera review, might not go far enough, I fear. And this is really where I'd love to get um, some uh, assistance from those in, in the room. I think that uh, in camera review might not go far enough since recognizing that a judge can compel production of the relevant source code for their eyes only may leave a defendant no better off. <laughs> a judge is, I'm sorry, in most cases, highly unlikely to understand how to parse, test, or evaluate source code in a meaningful way. And a judge may not be very motivated to put that software through its paces. Permitting a judge but not defense counsel to access source code may also raise uh, due process problems similar to those implicated by the current regime of complete nondisclosure. The second tool, sealing court documents or proceedings, might work better, right? Relevant 
trade secret protected documents could be designated in not only, uh, they could be designated for attorney's eyes only, right? So even the criminal defendant might not get access to that. Um, such a designation would enable software to be tested by those with the greatest incentive to really do thorough testing, defense counsels and their experts, right? But at the same time, an attorney's eyes only designation might help prevent defendants from gaming the system um, in the future, which is one major reason that law enforcement has traditionally proffered in its own efforts to avoid disclosure of law enforcement tools. Um, but I'm not sure that this solution is an obvious winner either, not least because the idea of defense counsel intentionally concealing relevant information from a client might, again, raise due process problems of its own. And the public generally has a First Amendment right of access to criminal proceedings, which further complicates this perhaps otherwise neat looking solution. So that's kind of where I'm at. I would love your thoughts on possible solutions. Uh, and thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so repeat, that. Repeat the oh, yes, right. So Nicholson, thank you, um, asks why not just have a rule that if you want to develop something that's going to be useful in criminal justice, say no trade secret protection for you, um, which is often the solution that my crim law friends uh, answer me with. And I, I don't know that that's really drawing the right balance either, right? So w we don't want to necessarily. Um, under incentivize folks to create these kinds of technologies by saying that, that they can't have any sort of protection in that arena. Um, and so I'm not sure that that, or I fear that that might go too far in the other direction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the outcome of some of the software without, in fact, examining its source code. Victoria Stodden at Illinois has written, I mean, it's essentially like her entire oeuvre is about all the things that could go wrong here. And so I want to strongly suggest that counter arguments that it, is, that it is possible to get the level of scientific validity that you wouldn't say, like a Clio lab, without reproducing the source code of some of this stuff is actually not going to be factually present. That's just kind of a comment. So if I understand sure. you correctly, you're saying that accountability by design without access to the source code is less possible than I might be willing to concede. Yeah, you're, you're strengthening my case. That's yeah, great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, yes. I have to concede less now. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and a criminal defendant's right to defend him or herself, the latter always wins, right? And so to the extent that we're worried about, oh, maybe we should innovate more here, or we're worried about taking away someone's property, um, that my, one way to possibly think about that is that, that that should not be treated any differently than if you are a third party and you are in possession of your property that is physical evidence of a crime. The police have a right to seize it and to keep it and not even to um, and so to the extent that that's what's going on here, I, I don't see, you know, uh, one relatively easy way to have one thread through one <laughs> <laughs> is just to say property is property is property. It doesn't matter if it's trade secrets or not. To the extent that you, the company, want to use this in the determination of either sentencing or criminal guilt or something like that, be at you. Great. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and also around testing concerns that the results that were being tested by IT were based on information that was not available to the parties to review. And I think that ties in with Jacob's saying, what Jake was saying in terms of you know, the, the defendant gets to win, right? And, and in response to your concern about is it you know, under incentivize um, the development of these products, I think what it should do properly, at least in our understanding of, of penal law and the Fourth Amendment, is it should under incentivize the use by prosecutors if they don't have access to that underlying information because the defendant is entitled to that information if it enters your system. Okay, I, I am hearing lots of pushback on, on Elimination of trade secrets goes too far. Great. I, I'm sympathetic to that view. I try, I've been trying to, to find ways maybe not to go that far, though I am sympathetic to that just because I worry about going too far and then losing credibility in that direction. But I, I'm getting the sense in the room that right. you're all sympathetic to that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Glenn. So the paper is set up as a joiner, not a splitter paper, and I kind of want to put pressure on that and just say, you might think of the three examples that Bruce has been to understand what the right answer is. You have to say the as against what, right? So it might be that even a black box, no trade secrets be processed is better than the alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, the case of uh, the sentencing might be a good example. That right. You think you can't figure out the system scores very well. We don't know exactly what one needs to know, which is true. As long as we're convinced that which is true is better than what the judge would do without it. So mm -hmm. this is a question for you. I might have to think about these. Yeah. Things. Yeah. So, um, so for the camera. Sorry, Glenn's comment is uh, it may be that these algorithms are problematic, but they're less problematic than uh, than the kind of uh, impressionistic. yeah judges' impressionistic views and ad hoc sentencing. Mm -hmm. who write the algorithm, yeah. and those might not be detectable yeah. even if everyone has access to the source code, right? And so, um, and you can even think about artificial intelligence situations where the developers themselves are not fully aware of what's happening and what kind of biases are being kind of perpetuated by the algorithms, right? So I think that's um, uh, maybe for future work some, uh, kind of a broader issue to deal with. Objectiveness. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Stephanie. I'm going to not repeat that so I can get to one more hand. Yes. It's very fast, and I, I apologize because it's not going to help you. But <laughs> That's okay. But in the world I of welcome legal, it. In the world of legal realism, as our, our colleague from Alabama will probably know all too well, our new AG has rejected the actual use of science to prove or disprove the, the predictive value of a lot of these tools, old fashioned tools, including, and, and algorithms seem to know better. So I. I find, it I, mean, I find it hard to believe that we're going to start eliminating trade secrets in order to make it more scientifically provable mm -hmm. when they don't care if anything is scientifically provable. <laughs> I mean, they, they just eliminated the independent commission. They rejected yeah. the PCAST report. They rejected the NAS report, right? So you will have to fight an uphill battle on, on kind of a realistic political basis. I feel like I'm always fighting an uphill battle yeah. when I'm fighting on behalf of science. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, I have slides, sorry. Um, uh, a couple of hypotheticals. So, in the first hypothetical, um, a presidential candidate refuses to disclose her medical information. Um, later, a media outlet um, says that it has obtained uh, the DNA and uh, her DNA and releases a list of medical conditions uh, to which she's supposedly predisposed, including schizophrenia, polycystic kidney disease, and um, possibly Alzheimer's disease, and also disclose some information about her um, alleged Native American ancestry. Uh, the media outlet also discloses that um, she might not be the daughter of her father based on this, these findings, and um, lo and behold, she's also a carrier of the infidelity gene. Um, okay. Second hypothetical, um, we have an actor with red eyes, um, and he says, or someone says on his behalf, that these, this is an 
um, uh, unique mutation that he has, but uh, other conduits say that um, it's probably uh, um, very good contacts. And so some of the paparazzis who regularly stalk him obtain a DNA sample, they test it, they, and then they sell whatever it is that they found or didn't find, and um, a tabloid um, discloses that he apparently has this unique um, allele that makes his um, iris transparent, so you can see the blood vessels from behind. And someone, uh, one of the commentators also says, you know, he's probably, he probably has a really great night vision because he's practically a cat. So um, all of a sudden, a few months later, you have um, stem cell labs in Florida and Texas um, offering all sorts of stem cell treatments where they design the stem, your stem cells, your iris stem cells, assuming there is such a thing, to have that mutation. And of course, there's a line of hunters and, and uh, vampiricists. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, vampirists. Um, there's a whole terminology, and I don't mean to offend anyone who's an adherent. So, um, uh, so uh, originally, I also wanted to show you the, the clip from uh, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. I don't know if anyone uh, knows that, where, where he boasts um, an Agnita's turd. Um, but I come from the state of Georgia, and there's a boob in that scene, so I'd rather not be. Uh, um, so, so we we are. So the, the question is, what what happens? Like, what, what, where do we stand with all that? I mean, we all we all feel there's something wrong here. We don't really know what's the legal result or or how we treat these kind of situations. Um, Unfortunately, my co-author and I are not the first uh, to think about them. We have, to our dismay, we have discovered that um, um, Robert Greene and George Annis published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2008 um, called The Genetic Privacy of Presidential Candidates, where they warned of shortcomings of actually um, testing the, the genetics of uh, presidential candidates. They warned of what they called genetic McCarthyism, um, then following uh, Green and Annis, um, uh, Fox News, uh, Megyn Cayley um, actually dubbed the term uh, genetic paparazzi and, and warned that this might happen to every one of us. Um, later, Fox News also published an article, also in 2008, where it reported that Scarlett Johansson was selling a used tissue on eBay, her used tissue on eBay for charity. And another outlet reported that she was able to actually um, get $5,300 for that. And then in 2012, as genetic uh, uh, testing technology and, and, and sequencing technology moved forward, someone else hypothesized that she might be sorry for selling that tissue back in 2008. So in, in our article, we are going to try uh, to look at these situations through a, a legal lens and try to hypothesize how a court might and perhaps how a court should approach um, this type of cases. Now, this type of case is characterized mostly uh, by the lack of consent. I mean, when we discuss what can you do with one's DNA, most of the time, we talk about situations where someone gave their DNA willingly. And we're aware of the fact, to some extent, that it might be used. Um, this is not one such case. Um, and what's special about these cases, of course, under privacy law, is that public figures um, have a lower expectation of privacy. And the more public they are, the more they put themselves out in the public eye, the lower their expectation of privacies are. Uh, the lower is. Um, so, um, so we, we've surveyed uh, existing legal tools, concepts, doctrines that we have seen in, in, in kind of related cases like Moore and a bunch of others, and, um, and we think that are likely to be brought up in cases like the ones that we describe here. And um, so we came up with this list of laws that we think would be applicable at least some of the time, and mostly these would be, and I don't have the time to, to you know, analyze each and every one of them and say how we think we should come out and um, where we might see what result, but 
I'll just say a few things about um, each of them. Privacy law, um, as I mentioned, it's going to be applicable, but public figures have a lower expectation of privacy, so we're, um, they might not be able to um, issue injunctions against these types, or at least some of these types of uses. Um, and as we know, candidates for public office, um, in the case of candidates for public office, there's a strong argument for uh, why the public is entitled to receive their tax information. Um, <laughs> general medical information, personal history, financial history, uh, etc. Um, the other main body of law, of course, is intellectual property, including uh, trade secret laws and uh, the right of publicity. Uh, the problem with the right of publicity that we feel kind of like falls very close to this type of case is that a court might need to recognize that genetic materials and information could be equated with a public figure's likeness or identity. We have seen courts equate uh, the right of publicity with their voice, of course, with their image, um, and with several other things, and now with slogans, and now um, maybe, maybe with DNA. We don't know. Um, then there are the torts of trespass and conversion. Um, however, to prove trespass and conversion, you need to prove that there was an abandonment. Uh, which, as we know from um, recent case law, recent criminal case law, might not be the case when it comes to DNA that we shed all the time un involuntarily all over. Um, and <coughs> defamation and false light might be difficult to prove again because, you know, if you don't misrepresent the results and you don't overinterpret those results, you may be able to argue that you're actually saying the truth. <coughs> Um, GINA would only come up, GINA, the Genetic Non-Discrimination, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act might only come up in, a, uh, em in an employment or an insurance context. And um, we also identified uh, genetic theft laws in several states. And, you know, uh, Jessica, you mentioned uh, Elizabeth Joe's article. Um, and again, this is in just some states, there is HIPAA, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, if you can think of more laws, I'll be happy to hear about that. But I think that for our purposes, this is enough, because this actually shows us that we're dealing with a whole range of laws that might or might not be applicable, that a court might choose or choose not to address. And so we don't really know what's going to be the result of something like that. And under each of these bodies of law, we don't really know you know, what kind of narrative a court would accept. To date, we haven't been able to find any case like this, but we think that there is um, a likelihood that we're going to see something like that in the very near future. In fact, part of our project is going to be to ask, you know, newspapers and uh, quite possibly paparazzi, why have you not done this until now? Like, how come you have not done this until now? What's holding you? Go ahead. Um, and we'll see how that turns out. Um, <clears throat> now, as George Contreras wrote in his article um, about the narratives of genetic patenting, um, a lot of how these cases will be treated depends on the kind of law that the court chooses to address, the same way we saw this in Myriad Genetics. And, um, and that really depends on the kind of narrative that the court is going to choose to accept to begin with. So, um, and, and what I'm really saying is that there is tremendous uncertainty in, in cases that, you know, we should expect to see or are not, they're not as sci-fi as they used to be five years ago. So what does that tell us? <clears throat> and we think that it tells us um, something about the nature of cases that involve genetic materials and information in general. Um, we identify um, six aspects of genetic materials and information that we think um, should be considered in cases that involve genetic materials and information. No? There we go. Um, 
And we argue that um, if you don't consider all these uh, um, aspects, you will probably reach um, either a wrong result or an incomprehensive result um, or something that might be directly contradictory to the result you might reach under another body of law. And we think that that's something that characterizes pretty much every legal arrangement or every treatment of genetic materials and information that we are seeing. So where are we taking this? At this point, we are not sure that we are going to take this um, further. We just want to point out this problem um, through this example. And later on, we might find ourselves engaged in something a little broader, kind of like what um, Jessica might be thinking about, which is, so what do we do? Maybe we want to think about genetic materials and information, as Glenn offered before, in a completely different way, not to try to adapt them or adopt laws to apply to them, uh, earlier arrangements, but rather really try to create something new that really takes all these six aspects under consideration. Um, and with that, I, I cede the rest of my time to the next speaker. Okay. Yeah, thanks. problem here has been that the abandonment argument has been made in a criminal context. Normally in property contexts, there was this it has to be an intent to abandon. In the case that really came out of trash can cases where the idea was you put it in the trash, you intended to abandon. The criminal justice system takes a somewhat different view. And I think one can plausibly argue that all that DNA we're shedding, there is not an intent. There's just an inevitability unless you put yourself in a moon suit, that you're going to be shedding DNA constantly. So you know, think about um, whether the, how, a how a tighter application of the abandonment doctrine might change this, change the setting here. Yeah, I think. So uh, really interesting talk. I, um, I was reminded during your talk of a paper by Bill Trade not with Bill So, you know, it is, uh, again, going back to your uh, point about broadening this in relation to your conversation with Judge Fontana, uh, should, we, should we pass more kind of EU uh, type of privacy laws that are much more broad and not so sector specific? So, again, you know, if, we, if you apply existing constructs on you know this case of genetic materials and information and i will put aside you know the facial recognition technology that sema discusses with respect to employers and all that i have enough headache with that but i do think that you know she, she's making a valid point that you know goes to to um, privacy in medical information in general not just under hipaa um, so We think that privacy has a problem. Uh, George Contreras is another article about uh, um, genetic property. And he argues that if you're going to grant more property rights or more, pro more rights in genetic information, you're actually going to suppress research involving that kind of information. And again, you, know, you see how you would say that this is a balance. But 
you'll see how one body of law, the one that you choose or you prefer, might actually get in the way of another body of law that represents a whole different range of interests, which in turn do not consider the first body of law. Perhaps. But we think that, you know, if you think about these issues, you need to think about them more cohesively. Um, yeah. Oh, um, ladies first. I get, I get the quack, the virtual quack, so I'll stop here and I'd love to talk more later. Thanks. I'm Doug Fox. Uh, I teach at USD School of Law where I direct the Center for Health Law Policy and Bioethics. It's an early project on which I'm very grateful for your feedback. In a 1928 lecture to the New York Academy of Medicine, Benjamin Cardozo, then chief judge of the New York Court of Appeals, said that the law is, quote, derived from empirical methods of scientific observation and inquiry. Let the facts be known as they are, he declared, and the law will sprout from its seeds and turn its branches toward the light. In culture more generally, he noted, the bedrock conviction that we humans are exceptional and superior had been shaken by recent discoveries at that time that our species just evolved from some others and that our planet doesn't center our solar system. So too, Cardozo said, my emerging findings in the biology of behavior force us to rethink cherished ideals in the law. Liberty. Equality, justice. His audience recoiled. There are certain questions that should not be asked, they said. Certain things that we should not know. Their reaction might strike modern ears, especially many of those in this room, as quaint at best, maybe dangerous. This afternoon, I want to try to rehabilitate a version of this unfashionable concern about research that might challenge cornerstones of our democratic life. Let's call it subversive science. After explaining what subversive science is and why I think it's worth worrying about, I'll offer some thoughts about what I think we should and shouldn't do about it. What makes science subversive in this sense that I mean it isn't that it deprives research subjects of informed consent or inflicts avoidable suffering on them, like the um, Milgram shock study or Tuskegee syphilis trial or the prison experiment here at Stanford. Nor is subversive science about the more tangible kinds of consequences for public health or national security that can be invoked in so-called dual-use dilemmas over nuclear power or avian flu studies. These more familiar worries about the means and ends of scientific research, deeply important though they are, are not my concern here. Subversive science is instead about the power that certain lines of inquiry have to dislodge public faith 
and ideals that occupy a prominent place in democracy. Consider two. First is the ideal of individual responsibility that underlies much of our law that requires adults of sound mind to comport their behavior to rules. The second is the ideal of equality, that individuals shouldn't be judged or constrained by the average or assumed properties of the groups to which they belong. For an ostensible challenge to responsibility, <clears throat> consider the neuroscience research pioneered by Benjamin Libet in the 1980s. Libet used brain scans, electroencephalography, to identify unconscious processes that can predict when a person will perform simple actions, like flexing a finger or pressing a button, not only before the person performs those actions, but even before the person is aware of his own intention to perform them. A putative challenge to the ideal of equality comes from a different line of research, this time group differences, especially in genomics that examines the biological architecture of socially salient traits, um, like, for example, what you might call intelligence. Now, scholars like Hank Greeley, Oliver Goodenough, and others in this room have convincingly showed why research like this will not, in fact, displace the most morally attractive understandings of responsibility or equality <coughs> that undergird our legal system. So I won't waste time rehearsing how the discovery of predictive urges still leaves space to preserve responsibility to have decide whether to override those urges, or that equality isn't the empirical claim that groups of people are genetically identical, but the moral principle that people deserve something like equal dignity or opportunity, whatever their genetics. Well then, why do I think that subversive science is worthy of concern? It's because even if it doesn't threaten abstract conceptions, of these ideals, it might still erode actual perceptions of them in ways that predictably distort legal decision making. I come across some indirect evidence of this proposition, so I decided to test it for myself. I enlisted the polling firm YouGov to survey a representative sample of 1,200 American adults about their views on criminal punishment in a particular case and support for Head Start educational programs. The sample was randomly divided into experimental and three different control groups that differed only in respect of whether they were presented with one of the three various audiovisual treatments in place of accurate and measured accounts of the potentially subversive genetic or neuroscience described. Uh, time here doesn't permit detailing every aspect of the experimental design, but uh, let me tell you a bit about what I found. Subjects in the group that learned about the Libet-style timing studies were far less likely than those in the control groups to punish a clearly guilty defendant when they were asked to assume the role of a juror in his case. It seems that exposure to research about pre-conscious intentions tended to reinforce mechanistic or reductionistic accounts of human agency that bypassed a role for the mindful self to drive his own actions. In the second experiment, the experimental group was presented with genome-wide association studies of gene variants that were only very loosely linked to educational attainment. Again, this took form in a brief one-paragraph written description and a two-minute video. I found that, con that subjects who were confronted with this research were far more likely than those in the three control groups to vote against a funding program to reduce educational disparities. The genomic studies, though their conclusions were described in fittingly provisional terms, inflated the very kinds of essentialist beliefs that Altacharo and Jennifer Handler discussed this morning in ways that appeared to confound their commitments to the ideal of 
equality among individuals. As I'll come back to later, these results cut acro across both scientific literacy uh, among subjects and their various cultural worldviews. Now, it's far from obvious what we should make of these findings. <clears throat> There's undeniable appeal in Cardozo's call to let scientific inquiry take the law wherever it may lead. Subversive science, moreover, has distinctive potential to free our legal system from false dogma. Now, this might range from exculpating minors for impulsive behavior to redirecting social resources to reflect the genetic contributions of mental illness. That could be a really good thing. Still, I think it would be a mistake to assume that the blessings of subversive science obviously or inevitably outweigh whatever social turmoil or legal instability it might generate. Now, I wouldn't ban this kind of research or cut off the funding necessary to pursue it. For one, as John Robertson and Natalie Ram here have argued, Restricting subversive science in any direct or content-based ways could raise First Amendment problems. Besides, it'd probably be bad policy anyway, given the spillover effects on other branches of primary research and the serendipity that characterizes many of our most prized scientific discoveries. But more to the point, reframing the threat of subversive science in terms of perceptions instead of conceptions advises policies that target the communication of knowledge, and not its production. Now, scientists who are trained in the technical language of their discipline can't reasonably be expected, I think, to accessibly communicate the significance and limits of their own research in light of the implications and controversies that surround it. But my study suggested that scientific literacy wasn't the problem anyway. That is, those who tended to distort their understandings of this science weren't limited to those who had trouble understanding its concepts or underlying background. And it's not scientists anyway, but really the journals and whose pages they publish that typically control when and how the public learns about their findings. So I'd look to those journals and other such institutional gatekeepers to mediate the release of potentially subversive science in ways that reduce their risk of entrenching systematic biases like neural reductionism and genetic essentialism. Cultural cognition research by Dan Kahan with Lisa Ouellette and others would recommend presenting polarizing evidence like this in identity affirming ways, for example, by adopting headlines or narratives or authorities compatible with diverse worldviews. Indeed, I found that hierarchists were somewhat more inclined to embrace the anti-egalitarian implications of genomics research and that communitarians were indeed a little readier to discard individualistic views of responsibility in the face of neuroscience research. But these findings weren't limited to liberals or conservatives, but they spanned the political spectrum in uncritically surrendering these kinds of democratic ideals. So what if, and here's just a couple ideas I'd like your thoughts on, uh, journals or courts or policy research papers were to add caveats, like findings uh, here shouldn't be read to support the view that free will is an illusion, uh, or that a person's traits are hardwired by his genome. Or do you think maybe a head-on attempt to persuade in this way would trigger a backfire effect, only leading people to cling to their misperceptions more tenaciously than before. Well, how about metaphors? Uh, like that the complex interaction between genes and environment is like cooking, in which the raw ingredients and when and how they're combined all matter. The ingredients here are myriad genetic and environmental influences while their combination represents the biological, psychological processes of development. And just as you wouldn't expect to, def to find discrete ingredients as identifiable components in the dish that's served to you, there's no simple correspondence 
these disseminators of scientific knowledge could convey to their lay audience between a particular gene and particular aspects of an individual's personality or behavior. Now, these are just a couple of ideas, some preliminary reflections on which I would be enormously grateful for your thoughts. Thank you. Yes. that happens all the time. And so in terms of your, um, your recommendations, not just you know, adding caveats about what the science actually says or doesn't say, so this doesn't necessarily support the, the idea that there's no free will, but a caveat that you know, this may or may not support the idea that there's no such thing as free will, but we as a community still have to decide whether we want to act as if there is something we as a community still have to answer the normative question. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Restate the question. Thank you. Stephanie Baird's question um, was how much of this boils down to the naturalistic fallacy that the scientific is um, can give us the moral or legal ought. Um, maybe a good bit. Uh, and I would take that as a friendly amendment. Thank you. I don't know that I have a whole lot more thoughts to say, except that I think that's really good. I think it cuts across a number of the problems that I recognize. I think this is a really interesting and obviously big topic um, that is, I, 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 I have a lot of questions about methods in your experiments, and I, one of the things I would highlight for you there is make sure you have checks for um, effective and motivated reasoning, which I think that's over and over. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm really curious about your effect size thesis. I think your thesis is that it's not the, the science that will actually dislodge it. It's the sort of interpretation of the science. And if you're talking about real world consequences in you know, the modern reality, then effect size doesn't really matter. I would also really caution you to use Libet, not, not to use Libet. The Libet study is an example. They have been roundly critiqued and debunked. Mm -hmm. And also, there's really excellent updated work by Uri, Miles, and Gideon Yaffe um, with a much more scientifically robust found and what they, what, what's actually going on in the brain. But what I, I think my biggest friendly amendment would be, I, I'm, I'm not convinced yet that um, you're, you're, you're talking about science and not only just scientific communication. I heard you say that, but that was part of it, but it seemed like there was a premise under there that there is still science that challenges these things at some, because of its interpretation. You're, it, it, I, I mean, just that, that's what you're saying. Science, it's not the science itself that it can't be. It's, it's people's interpretation and understanding of an incomplete science, especially when you're talking about something like Libet or genome wide association or something. So, um, so it's like, a, uh, it, is it really the science itself that's subversive? Restate that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Emily, Emily, <laughs> Emily Murphy offers some extremely helpful methodological recommendations. And, um, and the question of whether it is science or it's communication, that is a problem. Um, and you know, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure it matters, um, the, uh, the, the consequences uh, that follow um, uh, concern me. And... Um, and I think they flow whichever, uh, however they're characterized, uh, however they're characterized. And I'd be interested if they, those consequences trouble others as well. Um, so you were asking about solutions, and you said, should there be a caveat? You know, this doesn't undermine our being free will. And I think of George Lakoff's book, Don't Think of an Elephant, and uh, the research he's done. And he talks about the election. The more he talks about the problems with Trump, the more, the more the people which are solidified in the view that there were problems, and it could be the exact opposite of what you hope. This doesn't show there isn't free will, and everybody thinks, oh my goodness, this really shows that there isn't free will. So I would look at some of his research on you know, highlighting the thing you don't want them to think about makes them think about scary things. So 
Sonia Suter at George Washington had what I'm sure are brilliant insights, but all I could think about was that elephant. Um, <laughs> that's really good. That's, uh, that's really good. Yeah. That's a lot of questions. A quick question, quick answer. Thank you. I'll have a good enough. Great suggestion. Thanks all.